everybody, and welcome to Table Takes. Today is April 3rd, 2020, and I hope everyone uh, survived and maybe had good humor on April 1st. Uh, today, we're just, I'm here, myself, Bonsai, joined with uh, Derek here, Emma Bon uh, on the blow and right. Let me see if I aim this right. Boop. And then we got Christian. Hello. How is everybody doing today? Hello. Doing good. Doing good. Isolated. That's awesome. Uh, oh, also. Oh, uh, you know what? There's even more awesome news. If you guys haven't heard about the crazy awesomeness, that is awesome. Christian, have you heard some awesome awesomes? Oh. <laughs> Man, I've been hearing nothing but awesome awesomes. Uh, what are we talking about? Oh, games. That's right, because it's table takes. So uh, Gloomhaven uh, just passed its Kickstarter goal uh, by a lot. It's currently over $5 million. Uh, it's Gloomhaven, which is the Frosthaven sequel. Uh, just, I mean, it, it jumped up in just a couple of hours up to 3 million. And people are very excited about this for some reason. It's though it's as though Gloomhaven was popular. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe. Uh, it's, it's Frosthaven. Frosthaven is the Gloomhaven sequel. Right. That's what I just said. Yeah. Or didn't I? Oh, oh I, I heard Gloomhaven is the Frosthaven sequel. And I was like, uh... <laughs> no, I, probably, I probably did say that backwards. I have, uh, <laughs> I have word problems. I haven't had to speak out loud in uh, over a week. Mm. I'm, I'm proud of you for maintaining uh, the ability to communicate. <laughs> I didn't say I had that. I just said I have the ability to speak. I cannot communicate uh, at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe so, there's a potential that some people have not heard of Gloomhaven, as crazy as that sounds. So maybe we should talk a little bit about what that is. Yeah. So what is Gloomhaven? I mean, it is really the quintessential uh, <laughs> Kickstarter board game, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> yep, it is. If, if when we when we say Kickstarter board game on this show, uh, we're talking about something that's somewhat Gloomhaven, like almost 100 percent of the time. Yeah, we were yeah. talking about it before the show. This whole idea of uh, would you call it, Derek, maximal game design? Kind of just yeah. taking everything and putting some narrative in there and putting some tactical combat in there and putting some mm -hmm. leveling in there and just like one of each thing. Almost trying to capture even more than just a role-playing game experience, capture like a digital RPG experience, mm -hmm. like a video game almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I definitely think it's it's kind of the, the school of design of basically if something is cool, add it and see how it goes yeah um and like i think there's some very interesting like smaller scale versions of that like if you look at uh the xcom board game for example oh, yeah. um, that's not an elegant design game um but it's a great game because there's a, a ton of uh like kind of very small um very different subsystems in it and they all work pretty well but you just kind of rotate through and even if one system isn't perfect or it's not like uh, super detailed and it's not going to last you forever, that's fine because a few minutes later you're doing a different thing. So like, I think Gloomhaven is definitely the archetypal that game that kind of continued to push that envelope uh, mm -hmm. or that idea. And, you know, your comment about the, the computer RPG is interesting because I think a lot of people looked at it from a tabletop RPG perspective where in Gloomhaven, you're basically playing an RPG and you're doing almost everything except for having a GM who tells you a story and role playing back and forth with each other. Yeah. So I think that it kind of the demand for Gloomhaven and the demand for games that are like Gloomhaven, uh, I think shows like two very, or maybe three very clear things. One, people love miniatures because <laughs> a lot of these Kickstarters have basically carried through on, the, on their quality of their minis. Yeah. But mm -hmm. like two, I think people really want at least parts of that RPG experience and they may not be super comfortable uh, or eager to get in all of the RPG experience, but they want at least some of it. Yeah, like and the then, game master aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then three, I think people, I think there's definitely a value in having a bunch of systems that are good enough, that are not perfect, but good enough and interfacing with them all relatively lightly and ending up with kind of an a sum total that is probably more than the pieces are individually and i think that's what you're really going for this is uh, going to build on that uh that idea of having those like lots of different sub mechanics by adding some new ones of course uh to adding a brand new puzzle mechanic that can only be solved by playing through the entire game 
Uh, it's going to introduce seasons. So summer uh, will feel like more like the Gloomhaven, whereas the winter months are going to add like a whole bunch of different you know elements to the game based on winter being more dangerous and cold. I will say as a experienced game player of some of these Kickstarter board games, a lot of them are just not that great from a design perspective. Like there's been ones that they've patched out, done continual development. I'm not going to name and shame, but I've played ones where I'm just like, this just doesn't work. This falls apart. Mm -hmm. So like Gloomhaven works. I, mm -hmm. I haven't played through the whole campaign mode. I played it as a one shot, but just as a game, like you're saying the systems aren't perfect and no, I, I would say no game systems are perfect, but Gloomhaven does it really well with the back and forth, um, having characters have different objectives. So it's not just uh, there isn't quarterbacking to it like other co cooperative tactical type games. It's I mean, I think it deserves its success because it's doing a lot of things very well. And it's definitely one that I can get behind and recommend. Yeah, I think it's it would not have lasted so long on the board game geek kind of like top rated position because I think it was number one for quite a while. Yeah, uh, if it isn't still currently number one, um, it would not have been up there for that long if it didn't stand up to pretty rigorous play. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the interesting thing about Frosthaven in particular, though, was the note that it uh, allows you to kind of import your character or or supports the character from Gloomhaven. Um, which is a very like interesting and challenging design perspective, I think. Um, but it also, it really does further emphasize that feeling to me of an RPG like experience where, you know, you'll get really attached to your Gloomhaven character, um, you know, not only just from the campaign, but then you just want the, that story and that character to continue in a new location, having new adventures. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it, it it's, it's, kind of uh, wild to me yeah I wonder um with all of this like how big of space you need to save up because like the Gloofhaven, even the special edition box I saw it by the way I also approved the special edition box as weaponized as one of my <laughs> friends who's right. uh like brought it over uh, I think he's also in chat right now it's just like a huge box and it had like uh, custom like wooden laser cut frames and stuff to put all your individual pieces in so it's just it's it's like it, these kind of games are great but also the space and you got to commit to playing this game for at least a year mm -hmm. like that's that's yeah well there's i mean one of the nice things about it i actually have friends who haven't played yet and for our friend group want to get it but we've got a lot of people in our friend group and they're like oh well am i just buying a four-player game where those same four players will have to play for a year and it's it's not really like that like you can do at, while you're running the campaign you can have multiple one shots going you can have multiple campaigns mm -hmm. with different groups or you can depending on flexible have someone play someone else's character so there's a lot of flexibility mm -hmm. to it too which is another great benefit mm -hmm. Bonsai, have you considered making a little um uh weaponization approved by bonsai <laughs> little uh, stag uh, uh Ooh, sticker that kickstarter could have yeah kickstarter can be used <laughs> as a weapon maybe i should <laughs> offer my services please send me the games and i will you know, i feel like Wait. that might shut down more kickstarters than it helps <laughs> <laughs> well, well just have it be bonsai approved and everybody just knows what that means right it's breakable is it breakable or not kids, hopefully because if the kids find out that's bad. <laughs> mm. uh, but yeah, so uh, that's that's really awesome to hear. Is there any other like news you want to go ahead and add on to this, uh, Christian, for the game well, or not? It's big news in and of itself. For me to add news to it would be uh, disingenuous. So <laughs> I'm going to say we're going to leave the story with just the facts. Oh, uh, I hear that it is Vin Diesel's favorite game. Oh, there. oh that's, that's that cool. Up. I made that up. Oh, well, there you go. I just, yes. I just felt like I wanted to add something there. <laughs> yeah. uh, now it's canon. No, now it it's canon. <laughs> now it's canon. Uh, well, cur well, currently on... it is at it is at six point two million dollars, basically, oh, with about forty three thousand backers. That, that's wow. not like a money. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to have. Uh, so I think. Hmm? Sorry, I, I didn't get a chance to get the screenshot from Board Game Geek, but there's a thing where it's like the top hotness or whatever, and it's like mm -hmm. Gloomhaven, Frosthaven, and some other Gloomhaven thing, like top, top, like all top. So it's place. all gloom. Gloom yes. takes over. Gloom all the way down. It's Warhammer, oh, but now that, it's that's <laughs> what that's what sour beers meant because I the the way that the comment was, I thought yeah, they one... meant that uh, it was 
position 12 and three. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's a weird order, but uh, they <laughs> meant one, two, and three. Yeah. Between the one and two. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, so we, we are now going from good news to uh, slightly bad news uh, going on here. So if you guys are a fan of the Pokemon tournaments, um, I have news for you. Uh, Pokemon Organize uh, play is canceled for the year, it looks like. Um, so tw uh, North America's International Championships uh, and also the 2020 Pokemon World Championships are because of this pandemic are canceled for obvious reasons uh, but the good news is that people who have basically earned their points for this like basically 2020 will be invited next year automatically for 2021 uh also um like the like basically earning championship ship points are also suspended so people don't feel like oh no i'm missing out on getting all my cards because of x y or z like not being able to host the event so that's something to go ahead and just take a breath and easy like uh you know all sanctioned events including league club pre-release league challenge league cup the uh premier challenge and mid-season uh have all been just shut down so pokemon's taking a pause this is really interesting because for a lot of these dates, you're like, are we still going to be suffering the consequences all the time out in August? But the there's a ripple effect to this. And a lot of people are saying, you know, in a month, hopefully, or two months or whenever, you know, things are just going to go back to normal. And I think this is a sign that things won't really just go back to normal because like there's a lot of buildup to a lot of these events. There's uh, a lot of things that are changing now that are going to mm -hmm. ripple out into the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like if they're going to have their big championship in September or August or whenever the date was, you know, they need to have the feeder tournaments that determine who gets to play in that championship. And if mm -hmm. those can't be run, then you have to kind of either push the whole timeline back or in this case, just suspend it for this year and revisit it when the situation is safer for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bad time for Pokemon, unless you, you know, hunt them on Pokemon Go, in which case it's a great time to go take as many gyms as you can, because no one's yeah. there. <laughs> no one's there. Oh, as long as you happen yeah. to live near a few of them. Yeah, if you happen, or you, yeah, if you're right by a base. Um, I think the more interesting thing is if Pokemon, like, maybe as, like, this is just speculation on my point, just to start a conversation, do you think that maybe because of this, more card games, especially competitive card games, are going to go in the same realm as Magic uh, by going into a digital space? This might be a good catalyst for that? I'm sure yeah. that a lot of them would like to. It's a really interesting decision. Uh, we're going to get to magic further down and further along in the show. But there's putting making a game uh, CCG digital definitely warps the game and changes the way that the game evolves. Just making it digitally, it's not things aren't going to be the same. It's not just going to continue to progress without seeing any differences. You will see some notable differences in the way that the cards are designed and the way that events are run. So it's a bigger decision than just like, oh, we'll just, there's the whole technical aspect where technically there's big challenges to get these online, but there's a lot of other decisions that go into that as well. Mm -hmm. We'll just have to wait and see how things go. Speaking about news related to the COVID-19, uh, Emma, you have some things to talk about, right? Yeah, so... Wait, what the hell is COVID-19? <laughs> he doesn't know. He's been trapped doesn't in the know. Big Brother house. Uh, it, it's the 19th where, Raven? <laughs> it's the 19th where. How, how did I know that was going to come out of your mouth, Derek? <laughs> so the Gamma, which is the Game Manufacturers Association, which is a big organized industry organization for board games, is doing some really cool stuff to help support mostly local game stores and also become a facilitator to let both people and publishers kind of come together and work to make sure that these local game stores don't go under because in our hierarchy of publishers and distributors and game stores, local game stores are really some of the most vulnerable uh, parts of this 
whole moving system. So what Gamma is doing is they have a couple of lists that you can go and check out. Uh, for example, they have a game store locator with status info, which is really super helpful. So you can know, for example, is a store just doing curbside pickup? So I can order the games online or on the phone and go and pick them up. Are they doing delivery? Some local game stores are doing that, which is super awesome. Uh, some are they even open? You know, not everywhere is under uh, shelter in place jurisdictions at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. not, we're recommending that you go out. <laughs> That's definitely something that um, is not safe at the moment, but there, there are some options, you know, we're all kind of like feeling out what's the best way to make sure we support things and stay safe at the same time. Uh, one of the great options that they have on here is gift cards. So even though a lot of stores are closed, they're allowing the, or providing a way for you to purchase gift cards to kind of make a future promise of support. Uh, it's almost a way of, at least I think of it as a way of making a donation to these stores. And maybe you'll use those, or maybe you'll just go there and buy more stuff. You know, if there's, if you have a local game store, we've talked about it a lot on the show before, how a lot of these are mom and pop stores. They're really just uh, created by people who are passionate. Uh, a lot of them don't have your thin margins. Like, exactly. Yeah, the profit yeah. margins are nothing. Exactly. Uh, so this gamma list provides a lot of ways to support them. Another thing that it has is a list of publishers that are directly supporting local game stores. So one of the coolest things that a lot of these publishers are doing is they will drop ship the game. So the store, if you buy it through the, the store is just a storefront. Yeah. So you can buy it through there and then they don't have to deliver anything. So they don't have to figure out any of that stuff. The publisher will ship it directly to you and credit the local game store with basically a finder's fee for directing you to the game. Um, there's tons of different um, publishers on that list. And some of the publishers that are actively supporting local game stores, Atlas Games, Haba, White Wizard, even Wizards of the Coast, we talked about a little bit last week doing their FNMs, which I've been participating in. And uh, I, I did the thing, which is really cool um, for Mox Boarding House, where they had a form where you would submit that you provided the FNM and they contacted me right away with some really cool sleeves. So I Ooh. can confirm that this stuff is working and it's, it's legit. Yeah, it's, it's legit. legit. <laughs> Too legit to quit now. So <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, it's, I mean, it's a little, obviously it's not super fun no news to, to talk about, hey, I would love to go to my local game store. But in the meantime, there are ways that you can help to support and protect your local game stores. Mm hmm. And then uh, they don't have a full, full list yet, but I'm sure that like as time goes by, they're slowly updating. So if you don't see your particular store or local gaming store on there, you could probably contact them um, and ask them to apply to this, uh, like this basically Gamma's a website. Yeah, so, uh, and not every, not all local game stores know about Gamma. So that's a great yeah. way to reach out uh, and they're scrambling. You know, there are a lot of game local game stores don't know exactly what to do. So if you can reach out and say like, hey, do you have gift cards? Are you doing this? Mm -hmm. um, don't hassle them, <laughs> obviously, but <laughs> some of them, I, I've seen some amazing conversations uh, a lot on Facebook where local game stores are being very open about what's happening and being very communicative and having conversations there is a great way to get involved. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, the, on, the thing I'm, ex mm -hmm. well, I mean, on that same topic though, like the, I'm glad that we finally have a store locator, a centralized store locator, because I think a, a publishers, um, some of them had their own uh, store locators in the past, like Wizards had their own store locator, obviously. But having a central kind of independent store locator, I'm really glad that we finally have. So yeah. I hope that this is a tool that Gamma can continue to maintain and improve once mm -hmm. things kind of go back. Um, because anything that helps connect game stores to each other so that game stores can learn from what other game stores are doing and then helps connect players with those game stores is a fantastic resource in my book. So I hope yeah. they keep it up. Yep. Um, on other related news, um, speaking about um, like 
local gaming or not local, but gaming stores changing their habits, uh, Wormwood just announced that they're shifting their productions to make uh, coronavirus supplies for hospitals. So basically, if you haven't heard, they they released a Twitter and also an official page on their website talking about how to help out with the pandemic that is happening. Uh, they are going to be designing uh, like these uh, screens that doctors can use and, uh, you know, at hospitals, like a clear plastic screen or uh, however they say. Guard, yeah. Right? Yeah. A face guard. Essentially, they're doing uh, smaller face guards that are easy to transport uh, here and there. And uh, just like, you know, just as a further protection for the staff and for the people so the virus doesn't get spread as easily. Um, so there's there's a lot of like it, it, I like seeing like a salad uh, bar. Yeah. Like at the salad bar, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, the yeah, sneeze guard from a salad bar that you basically carry with you. <laughs> the, uh, I, I like uh, if you look at what they're sketching in the video. It to me it looked more like um, like a Minecraft helmet, like cosplay helmet. It was like a little cube you would put on your head. Uh, so anyway, as we're laughing, uh, yeah. I, I, just, I, I just love the fact that they're doing it. Um, Apparently they've been kind of documenting a lot of their work on YouTube and like having a series almost. And the recent episode where they talked about making the transition and, you know, having to lay off a lot of their staff and using their essential staff to produce what they can. Um, you know, like it, it, it's great to see companies doing whatever they can to try to help out. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, we, we had talked about how, it's tricky because a lot of this medical equipment is very specialized and they're running out of things. They're running out of the specific things that are, have been designed and tested over years to be mm -hmm. the most effective. And there's some questions now, for example, with a lot of people sewing cotton face masks, you know, is this really as effective? Is it worth me putting my time into it? You know, is it, are people going to use these supplies in an unsafe way? There's definitely a lot of questions around here, but I think importantly, you know, there's a lot of people are looking for things that they can do to bring themselves hope and to bring other people hope and just doing these actions, as long as you're like, people are very aware that, you know, there needs to be some testing and things going on all along to make sure they're not making the problem worse. But mm -hmm. I, I just really love seeing people like this do like whatever they can to try and help the situation. Mm hmm. Yeah, the reality uh, always ends up being more complicated than we like to think. Yeah. Yes. So not everything helps as much as we might want, but uh, I love seeing everybody come together to help out in whatever capacity they can. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, as people who are like, it is good to to spread hope, but it's also good to to also protect yourself. Make sure that if you're going to try to do something that it is uh, under regulation in certain formats, uh, research a little bit before you try to build or make or create anything. And then uh, because there are, and also 3D printing, there has been like, you know, uh, people trying to make parts and stuff. Make sure that you also know that these parts are allowed to be made and under sanitary conditions. That's always, you just have to keep that in the forefront of your mind because good intentions, bad intentions all pave the same road. Yeah, do some research before Yeah, just you do some in. research. <laughs> yes, always research. Oh, but speaking of research, you've been researching some new stuff, right, Emma? <laughs> I oh. have, yes, because oh. it oh. is spoiler it. season. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> spoiler season. Clip. There we go. <laughs> it is spoiler season for Ikoria with lots of great announcements. Uh, and this is all just pure fun stuff. They've been teasing this idea of Ikoria and monsters, behemoth. Like we've been talking about this for a few months and now we finally get to see what this means. And it is all amazing and fantastic and even better than we could have hoped. Uh, yeah, so they have some stuff, information about the pre-orders. They have a sweet new trailer, so you should definitely check that out. Uh, great music, and it's got Vivian being a badass in it, and so uh, it's another more great content from Wizards. Uh, yeah, and so, uh, so so the 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 character in the trailer is Vivian, and yeah. the world is Ikoria, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I I did have a uh, I got in a a questionable dispute with my wife because she was like, no, no, the lady's Ikoria, and I'm oh. like, I mean, okay, I guess. <laughs> well, no, this is Vivian, who's been uh, who's basically uh, an awesome huntress, uh, planeswalker, and she's been in the set uh, for a while, and now finally gets her time to shine, which is super exciting. She always had a has she always had a super sweet bow that summons giant cats. Yes. 
Yeah, that's she, kind of her thing. She's got a tragic backstory, as a lot of the planeswalkers do. Um, and I think like her plane was destroyed, and this is just like her whole planet basically was destroyed, and this is the only remnants of it left are the spirits that are stored in her bow. Uh, if I'm remembering that correctly. So it's really, really sad, actually, to think about it. But also... I don't... Like, planeswalking doesn't seem to me a um, job that you get into if you um, have a nice, well-adjusted home life. Oh, yeah, no, you no. you really just want to spend time with your kids. <laughs> yeah, no, planeswalking is just all... Tra it's all the way down. Tragic backstory is all the way down. Like, just so much drama and trauma and... Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so... What this set is, is basically a giant kaiju battle. It's a bunch of really big monsters smacking into each other and has all the stuff that you would expect from a giant kaiju battle, including just giant terrible lizards and giant apes and... Uh, does, it have, does it have victim cards or building cards that can be destroyed? Uh, okay, well, there is actually... Uh, one of the cards that was spoiled is, well, before I get to that, first off, oh, like boy. I say giant kaiju ballot battle, and I literally mean there's a card called Godzilla. Yes. So this is, we, we had seen a little bit of it um, in the, the fairy tale stuff of like, okay, this is stuff outside of the magic universe. And like, oh, this is a reference to a thing. I get it. But this is... I'm, Maybe not the absolute first, but one of the first times that Magic has tapped into actual outside IPs for the cards. Godzilla. I mean, Godzilla, mm -hmm. it's not just like, oh, haha, I get it. It's Godzilla. It's like, no, the card is called Godzilla. So you get to play Magic games with well, Godzilla, with Mothra, yeah. the, with all these it's, characters. Yeah, it's the, whole, it's the whole pantheon of monsters. Yeah. 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 They're working with Toho, the actual, like, so it's legit. Yeah, it's legit. yeah, it's legit. Yeah, it's it's interesting because if you look closely at the cards and you can go to Mythic Spoilers to see all these cards, uh, they have the name so like Godzilla, blah blah blah, and then a sub name underneath it. So that Godzilla card is actually a special card that will only be available uh, in special packs and special ways. the The sub name of the card is the actual name of the card. So Godzilla is a special art version of that character, and it's kind of an alternate oh, name for that. Mm -hmm. okay. So, because, like, it, it's interesting because, you know, magic players, some people don't want to play with Godzilla. You know, some people want to keep their magic universe kind of in, like, feel like it comes from the same world, where this is very much, like, one of the Mecha Godzilla cards is shooting rocket rockets out of rocket launchers. Sure. Which yeah. might well, break I mean, the it's fantasy. Mecha Godzilla, like, when yeah. you expect Mecha Godzilla it's to Mecha do. Yeah. It shoots its toes, too. Uh, it's actually super funny. Mark Rosewater is doing a lot of chats about this, and someone was like, come on, like, the rockets in magic? Like, that's, he's like, what is this? You know, kind of in a disparaging way, and Mark Waters, Rosewater is like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's just Mecha Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. just a, a complete like ignoring the question it's like yeah it's but, mecha godzilla but having yeah. some of these cards basically be alternate art of uh, a different card kind of yeah. um it, it sounds like that might make it easier to design the set because you know you're not introducing a um, as many new concepts and it means that those cards will then play nicer with previous sets yeah that may have been triggering off of particular keywords or particular card names Exactly. Uh, the card I wanted to get through, uh, get to after I kind of framed everything there, was there's a King Kong card. This one isn't actually themed. They probably can get the rights or whatever. Uh, but it's Different company. you get to return a human from the battlefield to your hand. You, you get, it? get it to yep. your hand yep. like the, I the, the king kong yeah oh uh, and then yeah, i think you become indestructible it becomes indestructible until the end of turn you know because it can't shoot you because you have the human mm -hmm. there so how, how many uh as long as it doesn't have a beam weapon called a fey ray i'm good <laughs> yeah how so many these are of the people. oh sorry yeah no. How many of these colossal creatures can destroy artifacts just as like as a natural thing though because that that strikes me as another very kaiju -y thing is it just rampage through the battlefield destroying artifacts yeah well one of the things that we had talked about before the show uh derek i don't know if you want to say it or if you want me to say it but you said it felt very green mm -hmm. as a set mm -hmm. and you're like oh big stomping monsters that's a very yep. green color pie sort of a thing and 
they're they're still placing these creatures within a, with effects that you would expect from the different colors. So they have the blue ones that care about instants and sorceries, and the white creatures um, that care about life gain, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is this um, set is very focused on the wedges, which are the three color things. So they have a lot of creatures that kind of mix up colors. They can have lots of cool effects going on within one creature. Uh, the other thing I wanted to get to was, uh, if you watch the video, you'll get the sense of this, but so for these monsters, you can fight them, which is kind of a typical thing that you can do with monsters, but you can also be best friends with them. And that's really what Vivian represents is you getting to be best friends and these monsters are your friends and will fight by your side. Wait, so th does that mean that I can now play a game of magic where instead of a powerful wizard summoning monsters to duel my enemies for me, I can be a young uh, child who befriends Godzilla and has them uh, defend them. Yes. Great. One hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Godzilla is yeah. my best friend. Just everything. <laughs> exactly everything you ever dreamed of. Do we in the trailer? There's that. Uh, you know, to spoil the trailer. Um, you know, like the monsters fight. One of the monsters dies. And then like that crystal kind of pulses and the monster kind of gets back up. Do we know what that is? Uh, mutation. So there's a new mechanic in the set called mutate, which is, you really got to read up on this because it's crazy bizarre, but basically you have a creature That's what down. That's you for. <laughs> I guess I. Tell us the science now. <laughs> so, okay. So you <laughs> just talking about the science of magic is just so hilarious. It's like, so you got this giant snake and then you give it a giant battle ax and then it smacks someone in the face twice. So for mutate, you have the creature on the field and then you use the mutate mechanic and you just slam another thing on top of it. And then it gets all of the different stats from it. So there's a lot of different ways to mutate. You can get, uh, tokens ability tokens which is a new thing so you know creatures have death touch flying that kind of thing now you can actually get a token through this mutation process so it's like okay now this thing has this token and now it just has flying because it has a token on it which is kind of crazy uh, so yeah mutate is going to be a big thing of this idea of like hey you're giving these creatures stats from other creatures or at least giving it abilities from other creatures and then triggers when something becomes mutated it has really cool effects uh, another thing is the companion mechanic, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, if you build your deck a certain way, which even if you don't, it, I'm telling you now about magic, a lot of this stuff, even for experienced magic players is crazy out there. It's like if you only have even costed cards in your deck. So if it costs two mana or four mana, et cetera, you get to pull this card, the companion card. Again, we're talking about befriending the monsters from out of the game. It's not even in your deck. You just get to take it from out of the game and put it into play uh, or into your hand. So yeah, there's a lot of really wild stuff. Weird, That's crazy. wild stuff. Um, yeah, is there, uh, so is there any cards that aren't gonna be released or anything like that? Uh, yeah, so. Are there, are there leading was, questions? Yeah, <laughs> other leading <laughs> questions. So there was uh, one kind of weird thing that came out of this. And this is just one of those, This I feel nowadays there's just so many things where you're like, wow, you know, you never would have expected something like this to happen. So there was a Godzilla Death Corona card. <laughs> and yes, that is Corona, Death Corona. Because hey, Corona is just a word that means like halo, right? Or like- a uh, crown, yeah. A crown. crown. Yeah, Corona means crown. And there's a card called Space Godzilla Death Corona, which is a cool name for a card. And now, obviously, it's totally not cool. And obviously, they designed this months and months in advance. So we now, really could have called the virus that instead. <laughs> Space Godzilla Death Corona. Don't go <laughs> yeah. Maybe people would take it more seriously if they did. Uh, so obviously, they printed this card, and they're not going to pull all the sets it's a little excessive to pull all the sets for this card, but in future pre-printings and digitally, they're going to change the name of the card, uh, which means that those cards are going to be weirdly valuable, even just as an artifact of our time. I think it's going mm -hmm. to be kind of interesting to be like, hey, remember this? It's going to have a story to it, which is weird and bizarre. And yeah. Yeah. I think like I think just from as a as a like a background to this, uh, the Space Godzilla actually had that death like ray 
as they say, uh, that was the name. The the Corona was the actual move that it did. So this has been established years, like years, years ago. So this is just unhappy, coincidental kind of thing. And like you said, it, it'd be interesting to see how much this, this particular card will be worth in value since the next uh, batch will be a different name. I think um, we're, we're betting how many houses it would be worth. Uh, how many okay. houses will this next <laughs> card be worth? And then your resident so, magic expert warned you we are not endorsing speculating on magic cards because it's not going to be worth any houses and you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, it, besides speculation, there are actually non-speculation things that Derek wants to go ahead and discuss like things that actually have been confirmed and not speculation. <laughs> Indeed. Nice. Uh, so yes. the American Tabletop Awards for 2020 have been announced. And this is like a new kind of award program. I believe it launched last year. Um, last year's winners were Catch the Moon, The Quacks of Quedlingberg, yeah. uh, Chronicles of Crime, and Root. Uh, so that, that was what was selected last year. Um, mm -hmm. This year, um, the four winners, uh, we have early gamers, uh, Draftosaurus was picked as, as the, the winner for that. For casual game, Ship Shape. Uh, for strategy game, Wingspan. And for complex game, the Taverns of uh, Typhonthal, I believe is how it's pro probably pronounced. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the winners for this year. They've been announced. Um, uh, I find it very interesting that both years have been a collection of Games that I've kind of heard of, but one uh, that I like absolutely agree totally should win, like Root winning last year, Wingspanning winning this year, you know, make absolute sense. Um, and it definitely kind of gives some, I think, credence to the other games, even if I'm only vaguely familiar with some of them. Hmm. Um, also, Quacks of Quedlinburg, I mean, was a mm -hmm. huge thing. Yep. And then, like, so you're, you're familiar with that. You know, yeah. I had played Catch the Moon. I thought that was absolutely adorable. So. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a new award, but they seem to have made some very, very good selections, uh, or, you know, the past couple of years. And I think, Emma, you had some experience or some context on um, the, the judging pool, basically. Yeah. So there's a committee here. You can go to the website and see the page for all the people who are on there. This is a really awesome, amazing group of people. Bebo, Ruel Gaviola. Uh, Jonathan H. Liu, Eric Yurko, and a ton of other just really established people in the industry. List. Yeah, just like some of my favorite people, absolutely, in the industry. And really smart people as well. And what I really like about this list is I see these awards sometimes and I, f I feel other groups kind of happen in an echo chamber. And you get things that are just like, hey, it's a list of super, super hardcore hobbyist games. So it's like, that's and their light game is, you know, one of the heavier games that I've played. So sometimes I think that they're kind of skewed in the way they choose these games. I think that the American Tabletop Award Committee has really na nailed it on ahead with these are absolutely games that I would recommend for each one of these categories. And for example, for their complex games, Taverns of Tiefenfall, it's mm -hmm. one that I've seen uh, lots of people get very excited about, um, definitely on the heavier end of the spectrum, but it's, uh, if you look at the whole spectrum from kind of an average person, it's maybe a, like more hobbyist average person, but you're like your average hobby, hobbyist gamer is going to look at this list and say like, I could play that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that the it's a very range accessible, here... uh, accessible um, award. So it's yeah. not the kind of thing that like, um, when you see a game that gets this award that you know you might be intimidated to play because you think it's too complex or too yeah. deep it's just like these are accessible games or reasonably accessible games yes that are classics yeah and are, are safe buy and it's not too approachable to the on the other side like just a mass market list you see mm -hmm. the games from like their heavy game is something that's still a mass market game i mm -hmm. think that that this group has just nailed it totally where a lot of the same recommendations uh, that I would give. And I, I love that they're doing this too, taking the time to curate this list because it can be hard for people who aren't as tuned in necessarily as us um, or some of the people in this industry. And again, again, these people on the committee just spent are immersed in the game world. So for them to filter all of this and provide us with a great list is really cool of them. The service. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So I'm excited to see what they do in the future. Uh, and if you are kind of looking for a few games to check out, then this is a short list for you to further investigate. Yes, you know, you could you could even look on the your the GMA site, see if anybody your local gaming stores are open, and then order from them, and you know, do some kind of pickup or digital asset service too. So mm -hmm. that's all. Great good callback, Dante. Yeah, thank you. I, I try. I try. Uh, speaking of which, since you guys, uh, since people might be looking for things to do. Uh, later on, uh, Emma, you have some news that Asmo Day is uh, coming out with some stuff that people can start playing and getting their hands on. Yeah, so this is a digital board game sale. All of the games on this list are going to be available through Steam. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an interesting thing that as someone who's used Steam for years, I haven't realized, but a lot of people don't necessarily know what Steam is. It's actually something you just get, download it for free, and play board games on it. It's mostly used for video games, but it's mm -hmm. It's a storefront and it's actually pretty simple and straightforward to get into. And it's a great way to play a, a lot of these games that are now on sale. For example, Scythe for 10 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Digital version of Scythe, like that's just a great pickup there. Uh, Lord of the Rings Adventure card game, Twilight Struggle. <laughs> I was actually talking about this with my husband the other day about like whether we really wanted to play this. I'm like, I feel like I should play it for educational purposes. It gets uh, really in depth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but now it's but but now it's yeah. four dollars. So yeah. it's like you're yeah, for four I bucks. guarantee that you will get four dollars of entertainment out of this game. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh Carcassonne's another great one. Splendor, I actually just played for the first time within the last couple of weeks and uh -oh. really enjoyed it. I thought that I would yeah. enjoy it, but I just hadn't gotten around to it. Um so that's another one that I, I haven't see. played the digital adaptation yet, but I love the physical one because of yes. the tactile oh my gosh. Chips. Yeah. So I'm really curious how it translates to digital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and a bunch of other games. You can click on the list and see all the games that are available on here. Uh, and I know that, you know, we've had this discussion numerous times about the digital versus the physical implementations. Now it's like, this is the option. This is what you got. You got the this option of playing got. it uh, <laughs> digitally or not at all. So I think it's a great opportunity to actually get in there and see like, hey, this is, you know, it's not the same. It's never going to be the same, but it's still fun and you can play with other people. Uh, I believe mm -hmm. a lot of these, um, some of them might be local only, but I believe m most, if not all of them, have an online play component. So you can play with people who are not in the same place with you. Hop on Zoom or get on Discord so you can have voice or video with people. And it's a, a great way to connect with other people. Yeah, well, like mm -hmm. some of the other games, you know, there's Agricola, uh, Isle of Sky, Love Letter, Mysterium, like, all these games for somewhere between $2 and $10. So like if nothing else, this seems like the perfect time for everyone to start a digital board game collection. You know, a lot of people might already have these physically, but if you had a board game night with your friends and you can't get out anymore and you want mm -hmm. to still play board games with your friends, you know, buy a handful of these that you enjoy and uh, start building up your digital shelves. Yeah, Plus, uh, and a lot of these have uh, tutorials to them too. Mm -hmm. So they'll teach yep. you how to play the game. And if you start that collection like right now by doing that, uh, I can add to it by the end of the show. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of things, from a Christian, our resident film expert, you have some interesting oh. things to loop us into. I, I, how did I become the film <laughs> expert? That is just lies. <laughs> uh, well, I, I had. I think that might be the the best multi layer segue that Bonsai has done. So far. <laughs> yeah, so layers, I feel like we just need to appreciate layers, that. It was, layers. It, was a, it was a sandwich of a segue. I mm. I, I really enjoyed segue it. Segue sandwich. Mm. But I do know I do know a little bit about uh, Amazon Prime because I own Amazon. Did you know that? Oh that's wow, that's nice. No, 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 no. Uh, but live now on Amazon Prime, the Tale from the Loop series is available. You can stream it right this second on Amazon. That's wonderful news as we've talked. Once about. our show is done. One, yeah, well, I mean, live. <laughs> you can keep, do both, multi-screen it. Yeah, exactly. So just watch it all. You've got nothing to do right now, just do it. Uh, and of course they made an official announcement about the Tales from the Loop uh, co-op board game headed to Kickstarter next week from Free League. Mm -hmm. So, that's great news too, but it's small news, just little mm -hmm. news. Uh, wanted to get some happy stuff in there since you know we've been talking about uh, the COVID thing. 
Where yep. ravens everywhere. Ravens. Ravens. The were ravens are watching. <laughs> All right, Bonsai. Speaking yes, of happy it, news. In other happy news, uh, so I don't know if you guys were watching April first. Uh, Love letter. Uh, kind of released a, a level letter game pack that you print and play kind of edition uh, that people are like, oh, this is a joke one, but it actually is a free legit love letter uh, game. It's called uh, Love Letter Senders. So in here, uh, it has a couple of very interesting cards uh, that I think would just, you know, if you enjoy Love Letter and want to have a little bit of humor in there, uh, the theme of it is parodies of modern online matchmaking. So there's the quote, like you just need to see the art in here to understand some of the jokes where they have some uh, card that is the catfish, uh, hashtag no filter, um, the, the, and perfect match. So it's which it's Love Letter Tinder edition. Yeah, yes. the Love Lender <laughs> Tinder edition, if you guys wanted to go ahead. So it's it's it was revealed as an April Fool joke, and it's kind of like a little, oh, hey, you can actually just print and play it for free. Print it out, play it, and it just replaces some of, like, the recar cards of, like, the princess, the countess, the guard, um, and just applies it to a modern, uh, modern Tinder, like, Fish in the sea, is that still around? Plenty of fish in the sea kind of game. So. Well, I, don't, I don't think dating sites ever die. They just like morph into some weird community or something. Love me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they go they go full of curious. They're all doomed to become porn. <laughs> but uh, this, we're, we're, yeah. Yeah, this is amazing. I Love Letter is probably one of the games I've played the most. You know, to just carry it around. It's super portable. It just, it's easy to teach people. I've played this game so many times. Uh, it's always fun. And this edition looks hilarious uh, mm -hmm. and free. I mean, what more could you want? Yeah. So all you have to do is uh, do the dreaded work of printing it out yourself and cutting out the cards. Oh, no. Wait, <laughs> I have a lot of experience I'm with out. that. <laughs> You're out. Oh, no. Who I'm sorry. Who has the time for that right now? <laughs> and I believe somebody in chat said that it's on Steam as well. Love letter is. Uh, I don't oh, know love letter. Okay. This expansion is, but love letter is probably as my day sale. Yeah. Yes, my friends, that has been our headlines for today. But don't worry, guess what? We have more coming because now it's ba 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 bundle boss with Christian. Oh, that's me. Yes. All right. Well, we uh, bundles are stacked this week, guys. I don't even know what to tell you. There are there is so much, and uh, all of it. Most of it, rather, uh, seems to all be uh, supporting the same cause, which is great. This is all about, the first one is called, uh, get this, the Conquer COVID-19 Bundle. That's that's a great name for one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am so <laughs> glad you agree. So this has a 45 video games Whew. and 26 books. Ooh, that's a lot. It, it is a lot. And it's not just like, it, there's, a, there's a bunch of great indie games on there, first of all. Uh, a bunch stuff that you've mm -hmm. seen on your console, stuff that you've seen on Steam. All of it's available to get through Steam, but it's also got. I mean, and I'm talking about stuff that's like like Hollow Knight and Super Hot and games mm -hmm. that you've probably played already. In addition yep. to like big AAA titles like Dark Siders and Sniper Elite. That mm -hmm. I mean, and that's just the video game stuff. Yeah, in, into the breaches in here, and yep, you know, if anybody remembers, if I remember Ender's, um, you know, uh, FTL. Um, yeah, Into the Breach is a fantastic game from the same team. Brothers is in here, which was like one of the most emotional video games I've played in a long time. Brutal Legend is in there. There's a lot of like really great gems that I hope people will kind of revisit. And mm -hmm. some great like mindless arcadey stuff like Agents of mm -hmm. Mayhem and Speed Brawl. Also, yep. Jackbox Party Pack, which is honestly oh, yeah. one of the games that people have yeah, been playing get the most. Through it. That's what we're playing at home a lot, just because yep. like uh, we can all just pick our phones up and all play, and it's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's, uh, but it's all that's just the video games, and there's literally thirty three more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and like there's also uh, comic books and books in there, like Saga's yeah, well, first volume got, is in there. Yeah, it's got a campaign oh, cool. for Starfinder. It's got mm -hmm. uh, Lock and Key Volume 1. It's got The Boys Volume 1. It's got Spawn Origins Volume 1. It's got some great stuff, including, uh, uh, what's the Saga, the Volume mm -hmm. 1 of Saga. Yep. So if you're just, like, looking for and looking for great, like, graphic novels, they're all right there. Plus, a couple of nice, like, 
crossword books and uh, some self-help stuff. I mean, it's all there. Plus, a, like, you know, a $10 voucher to Music Maker. So it, it's really, really good for to, everyone. Yeah, it's, it's got something for everybody there. And it'll get you through, especially if you're fans of games. So mm -hmm. and that's just the first bundle. The other humble bundle is a 3D dungeon, 3D printable Dungeons and Dragons Lair and Terrain set that uh, is also super cheap. It's like a pay what you want kind of thing and comes with, you know, evil trees, hobgoblin city walls, hand cart, a bunch of houses, some 3D uh, terrain, easy dungeon stuff, and just a whole bunch of other crap. Like, I, I need this, actually. I'm going yeah. <laughs> like to have to stop early today just so I can get order this. I'm very excited about that. Mm. And uh, yeah, the, I, I suppose that is the danger of us doing this online now is that uh, as we go through the, the bundles and Kickstarters, about. we can all be like, Hey, wait a minute. Can you just hold the stream for a second while I go yeah, buy this? I'm gonna and, uh, order I'm gonna buy it right now. <laughs> yeah, one of the cool things is it uh it, it, so the first one uh supports obviously uh some direct relief and a whole and like all the other stuff that they usually do too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doctors Without Borders, International Refugee they, Committee, stuff like that. And, and yeah. It, it, all of those. And then uh the bundle of holding, which is the dungeon on demand, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Dungeons on demand. There's a bunch of D and D type supplements that are uh, mm -hmm. all third party, but a bunch, a, a whole lot of a whole lot of adventures, basically. Lots and mm -hmm. lots of adventures. That benefits save the children. Apparently, the bundle of holding didn't get the memo about the virus. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Also, the the humble bundle has raised more than four million dollars already. Wow! Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can we talk? Like again, a lot of people are looking just like they want to do something. Dollars. Yeah. Now and like, hey, if you can buy games and help the effort and have more things to help, help you stay yeah, inside, health, healthcare to sick people right now, and that's yeah. you know that's a better cause than any of us can ask for. That can you know maybe get us out of the house a little sooner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, definitely think about picking it up. It's like thirty bucks for all of this. I can't believe <laughs> how much stuff there is in this. Yeah. Yep. So grab it today. That's bundle. Do it now. Bundle Boss out. Thank you, thank you. And now from Bundle Boss to the Kickstarter Queen. Oh, oh. I'm working on my pointing because it's the opposite of what I would think it would be. So yeah. No, we even know where we are. I have no idea where we are. <laughs> yeah, the, this is you. You're yeah, here. We're, we're doing it. Wait, let's this do, is do Emma. arrows. Point, point, point. And then this oh, is Derek. Christian. <laughs> right, right. There you go. Here's a story. <laughs> Of a lovely Gen Con. <laughs> we have so, four very clever hosts. <laughs> <laughs> the most yeah, clever. really clever. Uh, so our first Kickstarter uh, is actually a very, very short one. It only has one day left. It ends on Saturday, April 4th. Uh, I believe it launched uh, on April 1st, actually. And uh, have you ever wanted an energy drink from beyond? Um, one of the great old ones? Then now's your chance. Because you can get Haster's energy drink uh, along with a miniature you can use in three different games. Um, Seems like a so, trap. Cool question. I mean, uh, but yes. What is Haster's energy drink? Mm, uh, the uh, the yellow can, I believe. Get it? Yellow sign. Yellow I, can. I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. Get it. it's, a, it's a thing. Like okay. Haster, the yellow sign, the yellow king. The yellow can. The can in it's, yellow. I don't know what any of this stuff means. Uh, Haster is the Haster is the king in yellow. Uh, one okay. of the great old ones who like uh, kind of haunts uh, art and uh, theater and hunts down and depresses people and then sucks them away to Carcosa. It's very weird. Anyway, you can now drink his energy uh, in a can <laughs> form. And he's made of books. So that's kind of uh, cool. sometimes yes. Uh, so uh, so like you Much can like actually get in there. I got you can actually get the energy drink if you want, um, but it also has a mini that you can use for hyperspace, Cthulhu Wars, Planet Apocalypse. Um, you know this is from Peterson Games. They have been doing a lot of uh, kind of you know KVGs of um, you know like uh, cool minis on a board and they fight, uh, and now you can bring the Yellow King in a new form. Because um, I think he's already appeared in some of those those games already. Uh, so that has one day left, um, and it was a very very short uh, campaign. We also have Death King's Guardians, 
which is three days left ending Monday, April 6th. And this is just, do you want a blood bowl or fantasy football team made of mummies and Egyptian themed undead? Then here you go. Uh, it's, it's again, like all the fantasy football yet, teams. by the way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, like all of the blood bowl teams, it's just too ridiculous not to enjoy. Uh, and also yeah. if you are the, you know, if you're running an army like a uh, thousand sons or tomb mm-hmm. Kings or anything like that, uh, I guarantee you'll find something here that you can adapt to your more serious miniature games. If you feel you need to do so. Um, but yeah, it's, it's serious. mummy football players. Come on. Oh, wait, so so that, this, has, that is three days left. So they're coming back to play their final game because they're dead. Is that what it was? Sure. Because in the in the notes, this is to play a Final Fantasy football game, and I thought that was maybe a different thing. That was like nope. Final Fantasy final and then Fantasy, fantasy football. football game, not okay. Final Fantasy football game. Because isn't I would so watch one? football if that was the case, though. Right. <laughs> but know, like, not, yeah. was <laughs> but what was what all was of the, the celebrations the end zone are the same? No, but but wasn't wasn't it Blitzball that was the Final Fantasy, not football game? Is that what it was called? I think so. I remember, I remember playing Final Fantasy X or whatever it was until you got to Blitzball and then just being like, no, I'm done. No, I'm out. <laughs> uh, not, it was the football. This. That's yeah. where I ducked out. Mm. Yeah, see? Uh, anyway, uh, three days left to get mummies who like football. Mm-hmm. Or hate it. You know, they're just forced, resurrected and forced to play. Yeah. You know, I don't know yeah. if they really uh, well, explore their emotional connection. It's not just the biddies anymore. If you yeah, want like a the... horde of monsters that happen to be mummies mm. that you can use yeah. for any game. Any game. Yeah, any chat, game. Chat, Except like, these chat... ones are probably wearing football pants. <laughs> yeah, chat feels like me where it's like, uh, I don't I don't know how, that I want to play Blood Bowl, but I just love these ridiculous armies. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about you, Emma? Up next, we have Trekking the World, a globe-trotting board game with four days left. Hold on, so, let me stop you right there. Uh, please tell me that this is about the globetrotters going to a Star Trek convention. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I would wow. watch. Wood, wood I back, want... wood back. <laughs> I'm afraid we have to break your heart here, Christian, because that's oh. not really at all what, what it's about. It's about actually going around the world and seeing cool sights and stuff. But I, I don't know. Maybe you could make it work somehow. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Trekking the World, it might sound familiar because there was another game that came out about six years ago called Trekking the National Parks mm-hmm. and by the same creator, game. Charlie Bink. And it's actually really cool to go back and look at that campaign and then look at this new campaign because uh, I, I did a little bit of digging because I was confused about exactly how everything fit together. Uh, you'll see that this is the first campaign created by this company because the previous one was under a different company name. So going back and saying like, wow, they've, I don't want to say stepped up their games because the original game also very beautiful, but Mm -hmm. just seeing the effort and the love and the care that they've put into like, hey, we made a great game. How can we make it even 10 times better than it already was? I think they've really achieved that with this. Just gorgeous art, not even just really pretty pictures of sites throughout the world, which would almost be enough, but it, they've done different graphical treatments for the thing. So not only does it, it's like, oh, that's the that's the pyramids or whatever. It's like, wow, that really feels like they've uniquely captured that landmark in a way that I haven't seen before. Uh, so for the art alone, I think it's worth checking out. Uh, the other thing that's cool in this time, you know, because people are still launching, anyone launching a Kickstarter campaign now is launching it into this pandemic situation. And it's nice that they kind of, made a nod to that and said, hey, you know, you can't get out into the world physically right now. So here's a little bit of escapism. Like the game isn't going to happen for a while because it takes, you know, it has to be produced and everything. But just looking on the campaign page, kind of looking at the different cards, one of the cool things they said about uh, some of the art was people actually planned their dream vacations based on the art from this card. Because you flip the cards over, it's got a little bit of the history and context of the landmarks, you'd be like, wow, that looks really cool. I actually would like to see that in real life. So a lot of really cool uh, 
small things into this game. And then mechanically, it's a route management game, traveling around the world, collecting different destinations. Uh, it see, I haven't played the uh, prototypes of Trekking the World, but it seemed a little bit maybe like Takedo, uh, maybe a more complex Takedo, where you're going around and just checking out things. There's different goals. Um, all of the people, there was some well-respected reviewers on there who were saying like, hey, it's a really great balance of simplicity and strategy, which is always mm -hmm. something that I look for in a game. Yeah, Trekking in the National Parks definitely got a lot of uh, good reception. Um, so I'm, I would only expect the, the same or better out of Trekking uh, the, the planet. Trekking Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Plus so it's that's... just nice. Yeah, nice to have like, it actually has information and details of these places. Yeah. So. And that's Trekking the World, a globetrotting board game. Not about the globetrotters. Sorry about <sighs> that. Uh, but it does have four <laughs> days left. Who want to check that out? I will. And then... Christian, what do you have up for us to look at? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so, Captain's Gambit, Kings of Infinite Space, which didn't sound interesting as far as names go. It sounded like another space game. Uh, it has six days left, and what it is is an asymmetric social deception game. You play as uh, a, a space captain uh, who is also a Shakespeare character. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like what you wanted, right? It's like this Star is Trek and thing I wanted in a game. <laughs> I had no idea. It's like you get to lie to people and mm -hmm. pretend you have cards you don't have, and vice versa, and you know, assassinate your assassinate your buddies there at the table. It's all good. It's it's right there. Plus, they are space captains, which is like one of my favorite things, and they're Shakespeare characters. Another one of my favorite things, and they've all been redesigned, and the artwork is super neat. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they're all they're all like weird different aliens. I think. Oh yeah, uh, Ricky the third looks kind of like Jason. Uh, Romeo and Juliet are both space serpents. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Brutus is a great alien with energy balls and a giant dagger behind him. Cordelia yeah. is a rabbit. Yeah. I think uh, <laughs> Lady Macbeth like, is a is a brain in a in a jar. Yeah. yeah. Macbeth like is a brain in a jar with an eye. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. gotta so, wonder how do they come up with these. things? I don't even, even care. Even as a so designer, I'm like, did it. it's given me something to look at while I'm sitting at home. Yeah. It's so, nice. like, this this game sounds very much like Coup. Um, the actual mechanics sound just like Coup, okay. except that you have different um, win conditions. So, it's not right. just eliminate the other players. Like, I think Lady Macbeth's, for example, I think you have to. You have to wound three other players, so you collect some wounds, and then you have to survive a whole round with everyone knowing who you are and the crimes you've committed. Hmm. Um, I think another one of the characters has to pick another player and help them win, and if they uh -huh. win, then you win. Too. So there's hmm. there's that's that's where the asymmetry comes in, is that everyone kind of has a power, I think, and a they different win condition. Very different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, so it's intriguing. Win condi there's multiple win conditions for every character too, which is kind of yep. neat. Mm, yeah. So if you like Koo, um, and you like Shakespeare, and you like Space Captains, which it sounds like Christian does, then mm -hmm. this is a perfect game for you. you if go. you like cats, here and you that go. Is, this is uh, some fan Captain's service for you. Gambit, Kings of Infinite Space. Oh, kitty. Oh, wow. It's just right up on your shoulder. There you go. There. Um, you see, why don't you stream the whole show like this? So the cat yeah. is right up there. <laughs> on your shoulder. Be because she's not, <laughs> she doesn't stay there. We'll see. Uh, so our next Kickstarter, we have six days left, uh, ending on Thursday, uh, <laughs> April 9th. Um, and this is Winter Kingdom, uh, which is a sequel to Kingdom Builder, uh, which was a Spiliaris winners in 2012. Um, so this is, you know, a very Euro game of like territory control, kind of uh, domain construction, um, but it is a sequel to an award-winning game, and it's from Queen Games, which means that there's a big box version of it that will fit everything. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you want kind of a classic, you want a, a, a new spin and an expansion, if you've played Kingdom Builder and really liked it, or hadn't played it and want to figure out how to kind of get into it, then uh, this one's for you. You got six days left. Bonza, uh, how about you? Yes. Uh, so with seven days left, ending on Friday, April 10th, I have Aquanauts Discover the Deep. Uh, basically, if you ever really, really like the idea of 
deep sea research and actually learning a little bit in your board game, this is probably the game for you. It's a uh, resource uh, or like research and engine building type of game, two to four players. And it is just, uh, it, it just like really tries to set in that like deep sea kind of feeling. Uh, you, you, science. Science. <laughs> it's just science. If you want science, science. all the way down. Science all the way down. Uh, this, but yes, uh, you basically what you have to do is like basically specialize in different researches. Maybe team up with another uh, other fellow scientists down there while trying to be the most science in your field. And then basically how you win is just you got to get the best science reputation. So you must be the most scienty scientist person with like your best facility to say, hey, look, I have the best science. Do you have my science? I have the best. <laughs> so um, it, I, I know I make it sound this way, but it actually is an educational no, I, I, I really, game. <laughs> I really, I want to go, I want to go to, to, uh, to a science convention that Bonsai has hosted and <laughs> to just have her be like, do you have this science? No, this is my science. <laughs> this is the best science. <laughs> Your science best is science. dumb. Well, so like this, this is definitely a project that I looked at and was like, cool, you're plant scientists. And then I watched the video and it was like, uh, you know, in the, the mesopelagic uh, layer of the ocean, it's like, oh, it's going to, it's one of those games that actually cares about the science. So, yes. Got it. <laughs> Since it's an engine building game, is it just trying to do like underwater wingspan? Mm, I don't I know. Guess. I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how what? close it is. Yeah. But it's, it's, I think it's in the same the general category. Yeah. It looks a little more complex. Yeah. Like it's got some more stuff going on. Yeah. It's got like, you know, the, the, there might be like, you know, new discoveries, new algaes, and maybe you can't retrieve a live specimen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you got to think what all, all the pitfalls of deep sea research has for you. Mm. But yes, that has. I've seen the abyss. I know what's up. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, that has seven days left. So April uh, 10th, Friday, April 10th, if you're looking to go mm -hmm. ahead and get the gate. And Up next, right, we have Starlight with seven days left. I believe this is our uh, KBG, our Kickstarter board sure. game of the week. Sure. This is what well, we were talking about Gloomhaven at the beginning of the show. This is similar, but in space. It's literally mm -hmm. maximal design. Just take one of each thing and just shove it all in there if you want the <laughs> game to just have everything. This game has everything. It has uh, just some narrative elements to it. So there's a, a whole backstory where your planet got exploded by some big bad alien dudes. And you're, now you're on a generation ship called the Sparrow. And it's got a interesting scaling aspect to it. So first you have your generation ship, which is uh, like this big. Uh, so you have your generation ship and then you have your little <laughs> ships that fly around it, but they're all you're kind of moving between the different scales. So it's not like you have a big, huge generation ship and then smaller ships. Everything's the same physical size, but it's stepping down scales. So you have your big generation ship where stuff is happening on your ship. You're trying to survive. Then you have, you're going to have tactical combat episodes. And so you're going to get into your littler ships where it's which just you. super cool. Yeah. Uh, which is you as a pilot, and then you're going to fight against other alien spaceships as a tactical thing. And then you go to an even smaller scale, which is you dungeon crawling, basically space dungeons, where you're going to be flipping out tiles and you have a character that's going to be moving around through the space of the mm. quote unquote dungeon. Uh, and there's, and it doesn't even stop there. There's all these customization aspects of it. Mm -hmm. So you have a whole player board that has your character, your pilot on it. You're going to be changing up your ship. So you get a bunch of different weapons. You take on stress, you get trauma. So not only are you affecting your ship and what happens, you're affecting your character and your backstory and just all of these different elements yep. put into this game. And we haven't really seen this as much from science fiction themes before. Mm -hmm. So it is mm -hmm. kind of cool to see uh, this scale of a game uh, built around science fiction. This looks both very really complicated love. and super freaking cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, not only that, the other really interesting thing was it has a companion app to help you run the campaigns. So you can have a companion app that's going to walk you through a story. And apparently that companion app will also allow you to make a story and share it with other people. So I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities for folks to design scenarios, mini campaigns, storylines, and share those out with people so people can kind of always keep playing something. 
Yeah, I think as a player for these kinds of games, uh, there's when there are so many systems going on, like I'm very design focused. So I'm like, well, this system has kind of some flaws to it. I don't know if they really did this the best. If you can get beyond that, like if you don't hyper focus, we had said at the beginning of the game, you know, the subsystems work well enough and you spend some time in that and you're really more interested in making this grand scale space opera adventure. If that's the kind of thing that's really compelling to you, uh, and, and, you know, it's hard to say before the game is re released, maybe all of these components do work perfectly together. Or maybe they're a little rough around the edges, but if you just really want that experience of all of these pieces coming together for a big experience, then just check it out. Uh, mm -hmm. Starlight with seven days left. Nice. Uh, with nine days left, we have Britannia and Beyond, a regional guide for Cthulhu Invictus. And if anybody doesn't know, Cthulhu Invictus is basically the 180 uh, CE era of Call of Cthulhu. So do you want to play, you know, Roman legionnaires trying to investigate and deal with horrible creatures from beyond? This is how you do it. And this book, uh, I believe, is worse equipped than the modern ones. Yeah, basically. Do you find <laughs> modern? Do you find 1920s Call of Cthulhu to be too easy with all that dynamite and guns? <laughs> uh, now you can get that. You can play on the harder level. You don't even get flashlights. You don't even feel. Yeah, the God sent it as punishment. Like that, no, bronze no. everything. Yeah. yeah, they're hitting someone with a wooden club, like hitting this <laughs> old one with the wood. Yeah. So this this basically covers, uh, you know, ancient. Um, you know, British Isles, you know, Ireland, Scotland, um, Britain, stuff like that. Uh, I think this is one of the Actively. first kind of really detailed settings they've done for the game. Um, and they're, they're framing it in a kind of an interesting way. Like if, if you think about the myths of that, um, of what the Roman Empire thought um, England was like at the time, you know, the misty isle kind of shrouded with horrible monsters lurking in these, these dark woods and stuff like that. You know, if you're used to Italy, going to, to um, uh, you know, England prevents or presents you with a very Lovecraftian kind of environment to begin with. So uh, I just love the idea of taking something that's been so done, which is Cthulhu, and taking it in a very, very different setting uh, of Roman era um, adventuring is intriguing to me. Um, and the I think the game... Cthulhu Invictus itself won like a silver any a year, a couple of years ago. So if you love Cthulhu, check it out. Nine days left. Very cool. All right. Now for our last Kickstarter, <laughs> the one you've been all waiting for with only 10 days left, Monday, yes. April 13th. We got the World Wide <laughs> Wrestling Second Edition. <laughs> dun, dun, right. dun, dun. So if you guys haven't told tell on this game, you play as a professional wrestler. Uh, it's a role playing game where you play uh, narratively as a professional wrestler, not only your persona on the outside while on stage at the wrestling ring, but also as a, the person you're supposed to be outside of the wrestling ring. So you have to balance between your persona and the person you're trying to be. So there's a lot of onion layers in this particular game. What a wrestling uh, game should be. It's what a wrestling <laughs> game should be. So you, you got to manage both your online in-ring pers personality and the and your real life conflicts uh, that you balance in this game. So originally this game was reached in uh, 2015. So this is mm -hmm. the second edition. Um, so there's been a couple of redesigning. So the basic moves have been redesigned um, and, and stuff. And there has been like a little bit added more to the core mechanics. But if the idea of just role playing a wrestler yes. um, and also just like, is that, if that's yeah. appealing to you, you yes. want to get this game. <laughs> and and it's just like I could see yeah I'm actually very surprised Christian why is this not a stream for you already why why did you not <laughs> yeah, I, I'm working out. on something that's like this but it's a different game so uh, Ooh, I like oh. it. me and, uh, me and in fact Marcus is working on it too or we're doing it with we're doing it with BattleTech except wrestlers but but you could also but have it, this it is worth <laughs> noting that the first yeah. edition of Worldwide Wrestling um, I think is one of the kind of universally praised Power by the Apocalypse games. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think even folks who are not usually kind of into that um, family of mechanics uh, are have generally been really uh, well received. Like there's there's a lot of really neat stuff in there. So uh, if you have not played other Power by the Apocalypse games or you haven't found that they work for you, uh, you might want to give it another shot here, especially if you're a big wrestling fan. Like I played through a short campaign of the first edition and had a lot of fun, uh, but we definitely found that like it absolutely worked the best for the players who were familiar with wrestling moves because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. everything went very, very well. We leaned a lot on their kind of knowledge and understanding to help things flow through. But it was great. I mean, we had a campaign of we were wrestling in the ring and we had the ring storyline, but we all had our own personal life problems to deal with, too. And it was it was fantastic stuff. <laughs> I would say I really don't know that much about wrestling, but mm -hmm. just looking at this. It's WrestleMania think... weekend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Saturday and Sunday because it's too big for just one night. Yeah. I would love to play this with maybe some experienced people, but I, you know, it's. Uh, many board gamers are very into wrestling, which is an interesting crossover, these two niches with each other. But it's, mm -hmm. it's something in the past time I've been like, I don't know what that is. It, uh, it seems a little weird, but the more I hear about it and seeing things like this, I, I, I would do that. I would like escort me into your wrestling world. I am a willing victim here. <laughs> I, think a, I think a lot more people are into wrestling than most people like to admit or yeah. you <laughs> normally see on the cameras from the audience like Honestly. i think that wrestling fandom goes far far beyond the stereotype of who's in the in the crowd. my wife walked yeah. down the aisle to wrestling music that's all <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> nice oh my god that that's amazing. Yeah. is awesome yeah. yeah no i mean also like just watching the wrestling shows nowadays is really interesting because they can't have any gatherings right yep. but yeah. they're still fully playing to the audience that just isn't there. So it's just like really interesting to just watch these guys like, yeah. And so they even go up on the, on the, Their on promos the... are so much better without people shouting though. Like yeah. some of, some it's of the just, stuff it's... the last few weeks has been really fun to watch. There, but you also like pan to the audience, right? And just empty chairs. Yeah, yeah but like, it's it, just it, it, really. <laughs> it, it feels like really cool. this, this very weird theatrical, like almost Shakespearean kind of, um, modern uh performance art kind of theater thing where like oh, very much. You know, right, yeah yeah, yeah they're, they're they're fully acting they're acting like there's a crowd there and then you just pan over and it's emptiness and like the wrestling match starts to stare into your soul and you feel a hole that it needs to fill <laughs> i gotta yes, find I... these promos they sound fun like yes go they're ahead really and check good. that out and so that is uh going uh 10 days left april, uh, monday april 13th but mm -hmm. friends i have to say it, that 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 was all of our table takes friends mm -hmm. yeah oh my goodness i know we we got through it we got through some amazing stuff some not so great stuff but still ending with an amazing note but don't worry guys we still have a lot of things to offer here uh, on this but if you stick around so don't go yet because we still got a whole lineup coming to you a uh, new release rundown uh right now because of current situations we can't really have it but if you stick around we now have a new show called round table discussions and uh this specifically goes uh this week's topic is for people who have kids that are stuck in the home with them and they don't know what to do and so basically the topic is gaming for kids so if you want to go ahead stick around get a little information on uh you know what games sound great uh, from other parents uh who happen to uh love the uh, board games and their kids at the same time so um after that equally 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 or, or, equally or, love their kids <laughs> or um, more uh, or more uh, but yes friday's lineup also includes game night uh today at 6 p.m pacific uh today's game is going to be for the queen uh with myself Lauren, Marcus, and Jackie Dash. Doo, 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 doo. And so that's uh, that's going to be a fun little uh, Victorian way to go ho, 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 and laugh out uh, later on today. Uh, but like I said, Gen Con TV isn't just the Friday show. We also have a Monday show at 6 p.m. Board Games with the Brothers Murph. So if you're ever interested in various types of board games and want to hang out with a cool couple of brothers, go ahead and check that out. Wednesdays, we start at 9 a.m. with Minis with Murph, where if you want to learn painting techniques uh, and also joke around with the same brothers, you can join with that. Uh, 11 a.m. Uh, is uh, This Game Gets Dicey. Mm -hmm. uh that 
is uh, basically board games as well. Yep, it's a it's a lady in LA and a guy in London who uh, are playing one board game or another online in some capacity. So like oh, it nice. came up in chat that last week they played Wingspan. So some folks were curious about how Wingspan plays in Tabletop Simulator. So you can go back and check that video to find out. Oh, yes. Interesting. And then 4 p.m., you can go uh, watch Fireside uh, with Peter Atkinson uh, while they talk about the background information about D&D and how it started, 3.5, all of those uh, various like problems or adulations that they had during that time. Uh, and it's also just really cool to get a behind scenes look of how these games were made, what the thought process was. And also we have podcast of them as well. So Firesides are recorded and podcast and released um, on there. And then at 6.30, we have the Westgate Regulars where we take a bunch of writers and tell them to play D&D. &D. Um, so. Uh, that's always Roger fun. Because and... that sounds amazing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know that a... brunch is the collective noun for writers. Mm, a brunch, <laughs> a brunch really? Because you eat them. <laughs> I think that's genre specific. Hmm. Hmm. But yes. Uh, and then uh, now, if you guys haven't noticed, we did have a schedule change. So Fridays now start at two p.m. Pacific Standard Time with table takes, and oh, all the way man. through we do. A roundtable discussions and lending at game nights so my friends don't forget to subscribe follow uh turn on your notifications if you so you don't miss out and if you happen to miss out uh we also have all the episodes that we uh stream live here on twitch go on youtube uh 24 hours later and of course podcasts um thank you all for watching thank you derek emma christian for joining and gavin for having us. yeah and this oh, has been Table takes. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering hmm. uh, before we go, everybody's got such interesting stuff behind them. Like, this is what your houses look like. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah, this is what Bonsai's house looks like. Yeah, I have figured that's exactly what it looked like. No one's social distancing there. You yeah, could, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, like, you, Emma, you've got like the greatest little stuffed animals on your couch, and I'm very curious about them. Oh yeah, I have. It's a little messy back there right now, but I have a. I'm only looking at the stuff on top. Not, I'm not looking at the mess. It doesn't exist in my eyes. Yeah, I got All a right. meeple up there. I got uh, different don't starve creatures, and I got a hamburger and a bacon. All sorts of fun stuff. What right. I'm hearing is that Christian wants us to do a tour next time, maybe. Yeah, I, if time. you could, like, let's Ooh. hear about this stuff. Oh yeah, All maybe right. something game related. Ooh, All right. <laughs> next good. time. But yes, right. thank that was it. Thank you, friends, and we will see you in a couple of minutes. Bye! Bye!